Hola, buenos días. Espero que estén muy bien. Les eh, damos la bienvenida a este evento, el primero de la serie de los miércoles Wednesday at Home, que eh, pues pretende generar una serie de conversaciones tan interesantes como las que eh, tuvimos el fin de semana y que inauguraron nuestro programa. Y eh, en ellas toman parte figuras que han formado parte también de nuestro programa a lo largo de estos años. Eh, en esta ocasión, esta conversación girará en torno a la escritura en los tiempos del COVID. Eh, participan en ella Jonathan Liva y Francisco Goldman, Luisa Valenzuela y Gina Apóstol. Y para moderarla está la directora de nuestro programa, Magda Bogin, escritora y traductora eh, con sede en Nueva York. Y pues la dejo a ella para que les presente a nuestros invitados y que disfruten mucho esta conversación. Por favor, mantengan en todo momento sus cámaras y sus micrófonos apagados para que puedan disfrutarla eh, lo, lo más posible. Y también eh, les decimos que habrá una conversación de alrededor de 45 minutos, mientras que los 15 minutos restantes estarán dedicados a preguntas por parte de ustedes que podrán colocar en el chat. Eh, pues eso, querida Magda, adelante. Welcome everybody. We want to make sure that you all remember to keep your um, audio and video off so that we can spotlight all of today's presenters. I'm waiting for Luisa Valenzuela to be brought up on your screens. I don't see her, but I know she's there. And um, just to set things in motion, I want to say that this panel uh, promises to be very exciting. We have for amazing novelists who are also journalists, all practitioners of both fiction and journalism. And before I introduce them, just by word of preamble, uh, my apology for running this event only in English. I know there are some in the audience that would wish it were otherwise, but we are taking English for now as our lingua franca, as we must at this moment. And so um, everyone on the panel is extremely articulate and will speak <laughs> carefully and uh, you know articulate well so uh, for those whose English is a little bit shaky I hope you will get a lot out of this uh, in terms of your comprehension skills um, besides that I want to say you know we're not doing this under the volcano 2021 in a vacuum and neither are we oblivious to the great amount of grief of loss both personally and in terms of our ability to ache for the rest of humankind that is still suffering all around us, they're suffering and we don't want to dwell on, on the dark side, but we are living through something extraordinary whose scope and shape we are still uh, feeling our way towards. But I think one of the interesting things about bringing together a group like today's writers is to um, get a sense of what they're thinking now as we uh, witness a plague. We didn't know we were going to live through a plague. None of us knew that. Uh, it's easy to think of it as something from the past. And so when we think of witnessing, often we think of something that we are beholding and observing or that by empathy uh, or identification, we're able to uh, imagine on the behalf of an other, but we are actually in it ourselves. And so what does that really uh, begin to come to mean? Uh, can writing go on as it's been going on, whatever that meant for each of today's panelists and for those in the audience who are writers, or will it inevitably, irrevocably change? So um, that's kind of the opening thrust. And I'm gonna hand this over to Jonathan Levi who is a terrific moderator. He's a wonderful writer. And what I'm gonna to do to spare Jonathan having to do this uh, thankless bit, but which is also a uh, pleasure, is I'm going to just tell you who's who very briefly. And uh, 
as I've been doing in the other events that are part of this month-long conversation in five parts, many of you have been to the other two already, I have to condense um, extraordinary lists of achievements in each of these cases. So just so you know that there's more information on our website on the link to com Community of the Imagination, and I urge you uh, when this is over, go to your Google, drill deeper into all of these writers and order their books and read them from your <laughs> closest independent bookseller. So uh, this is alphabetical order. Gina Apostol grew up in the Philippines and lives in Western Massachusetts and New York, where she writes, according to her own description, novels on revolution and language, power and translation, storytelling and history. Her most recent work has focused on the Philippine-American War and acts of narration as forms of invention and liberation. Her third book, Gun Dealer's Daughter, won the 2013 Penn Open Book Award. And her fourth novel, Insurrecto, was named by Publishers Weekly one of the 10 best books of 2018. Her essays and stories have appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, Foreign Policy, Gettysburg Review, Massachusetts Review, and others. Gina Apostol teaches at the Fieldston School in New York City. Francisco Goldman was born too. I'm taking these words from you all, so the emphasis may not exactly fall where you meant it, but here it goes. It's what intrigues me. To a Guatemalan Catholic mother and a Russian Jewish father and was raised between the U.S. and Guatemala. Like the others in today's conversation, he's both a novelist and a journalist. I'm assuming a journalist first since he first made his name covering the wars in Central America in the 1990s as a contributing editor to Harper's Magazine. He's shaking his head, so I mean, this is obviously slightly off, um, but I'll just plow through because um, this is really interesting. His 2007 book, The Art of Political Murder, Who Killed the Bishop, a nonfiction account of the assassination of Guatemalan Bishop Juan Jose Gerardi Conedera by the Guatemalan military was recently released as an HBO original documentary executive produced by Academy Award winners George Clooney and Grant Heslov. Mm -hmm. Author of five prior novels and two other works of nonfiction, Goldman is, and now you must say this is correct, a regular contributor to The New Yorker, writing in depth about Guatemala and Mexico, where he lives during what seems to be a growing half of every year. His most recent book is the just released Monkey Boy. Okay. Luisa Valenzuela was born in Buenos Aires, where she still lives, although when not in quarantine, she's known for her indefatigable wanderlust. <laughs> she's published more than 30 books that include novels and collections of short stories, flash fiction, and essays. Widely translated and anthologized, she's been the subject of numerous conferences and studies, doctoral theses, etc. Major prizes include the Premio de Cultura 400 Years from the University of Córdoba, Argentina, the Grand Premio de Honor de la Sociedad Argentina de Escritores, the Premio León de Grif awarded in Colombia, and the Premio Carlos Fuentes for Lifetime Achievement awarded at the Guadalajara Book Fair in 2019, where Gabby and I were in the audience. She's just finished a collection of stories entitled Interior, day, interior, night, or in Spanish, dia, noche, todas las pestes, la peste. Luisa has led our Spanish language fiction masterclass in Tepoztlan three times, and she's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And now, Jonathan, my fellow New Yorker, I present <laughs> to you, he's the author of two novels, Guide to the Perplexed and Symptomania, as well as many plays and opera libretti that have been performed in Italy, the Netherlands, Georgia, the country, the UK, and the United States. A founding editor of Granta magazine, Jonathan Levi has also written political and cultural journalism for the New York Times, The Nation, Condé Nast Traveler, and the Los Angeles Times Book Review. He currently lives in Rome, and he is also a peripatetic and directs the Gabo Fellowship in Cultural Journalism in Cartagena, Colombia, and has led a variety of workshops at Under the Volcano in Tepoztlan, including journalism and memoir going back to 2014. 
So I'm going to vanish from the screen and hand it over to Jonathan. Uh, one other word to the audience. Um, there'll be a 15 minute Q&A at the end and you can write your questions in the chat. I'm assuming that by this point in our pandemic life and our life on Zoom, you all know that the chat is available to you in the bottom menu bar on your screen. So questions will go through the chat and we will field them and turn them back to the writers for the final 15 minutes of our hour together. Bienvenidos, bienvenidas, welcome everybody. Enjoy the show. Thanks, Magda. Well, I'll tell you, I, I'm extremely happy to uh, uh, to see my three friends here. Gina, I just met a few minutes ago, but I feel like I know her a little bit, uh, having read her wonderful novel, Insurrecto. And uh, Francisco and Luisa. Uh, Francisco, we've shared one evening together in Teposlan at La Luna Mesli. Uh, but Luisa and I, I think, have hit just about every watering hole uh, in the place. And I think that if I can just start off with a word of sadness here, the sad part of this is that we're meeting uh, here on the screen as opposed to, uh, you know, in the wonderful Pueblo of, uh, of Teposlan, which Gina, one day you're going to have to come and, uh, and join us there. I mean, I think that little video at the beginning just gave you uh, a little bit of an appetite uh, for that. But also because Teposlan is not just a place, but it's a place where our community uh, has grown over the years. A community of new writers, of old writers um, have come together. And one of the hard things I think about tonight and about a lot of these type of events is that we have to imagine the audience out there. I mean, I think one of the reasons that writers, we writers who work so much on our own during the day, one of the reasons we like doing these type of things is to have real living people out there in front of us so that as we're gabbing about and saying whatever gassy things we're saying, we hope that there's some kind of buzz coming from the audience, you know, back out to us. So I'm asking in terms of using the imagination to the audience out there, to all of you out there listening who we don't see, uh, we hope that you can send us some of your buzz you know, our way, and th that can be part of our imagination uh, as we start to talk about what it, what writing is in the time of uh, pandemia. But let me start by, um, since we are in four different places, um, can you tell me a little bit about, uh, about your place now, about where you are in your place and what it feels like in this, uh, in this climate, in this day of pandemia? Maybe starting with you, Gina, what is it like up there in, uh, in Western Massachusetts for you? Uh, you have to unmute. Okay, yeah, there I have to go. figure out how to unmute. Um, yeah, I'm in Western Massachusetts and it's um, very different from my life in New York, which is very, you know, peripatetic has been the word used, um, but it's where you're, t where you're wandering around a lot. There's not a lot of wandering in Western Massachusetts. Um, there aren't even any sidewalks. Um, so I live in this town, it's a rural farm town with sheep and all of these um, goats and chickens and lots of birds. Um, it's a farm town in between Amherst and Northampton. So um, there is a there are towns out there, but I don't go I don't go out. Um, I only take walks. So it really has been just an isolation in the house and taking walks. And that's and the way you, it's been. Do you see people on these walks? I mean, are there people? No, there, you know, it's um, <laughs> very rare. Um, People are also not going out. Um, as I said, I always joke about the fact that, you know, the Puritan world is the perfect world for um, the pandemic. You know, it's, it's everything is already socially distanced culturally. So, um, no, I don't see people. No. Yeah. How about for you, Luisa, down uh, in Buenos Aires? Uh, uh, well, uh, yeah. it's getting tougher and tougher by the minute here now. But we had a very quiet, quite a quiet summer. We had a difficult winter and uh, the pandemic and we had to close in and all that. But then we started being able to get out. So 
No, things are getting bad again, but I do walk around my neighborhood, which is quite calm. We wear masks, we always wear masks. I do go to restaurants, but the sidewalk restaurants or terraces or gardens. And, uh, well, life doesn't seem that bad now, but I'm afraid it will be bad again. And there are more deaths and, and sadness around us and worries. Are you, are you but I'm in Buenos Aires. I am yeah. in Buenos Aires, not downtown. So I'm in a quiet neighborhood, which is called Belgrano, and I have a nice garden. So I cannot complain. I cannot complain. And I have a dog and a parrot and two turtles, and life is good, in, in a sense. Are you vaccinated down there? Are they, uh, has the vaccine come? Yes, the vaccine is coming. I had the first dose already. I had the first dose of Oxford AstraZeneca. And a friend of mine said, well, we'll see if it catches. If, what, how, do, how do you say it now? Do you say Malvinas or Falkland? And I say, I say for Venus, because it's only the first dose. Right. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> but we are for the Malvinas, of course. <laughs> Covexit. Yeah. <sorry>. yeah. <laughs> but and the Bob, British you're vaccine. In Mexico, you're in Mexico City, where uh, I just hear horror stories. But is that true? Uh, is it or the horror is... stories? Uh, were true for quite a while. Um, some of them were exaggerated. Uh, well, you can't really exaggerate this level of suffering, really, you know, but I, but I actually sometimes saw what was actually happening in Mexico City depicted in a way that seemed to have um, political motivations to try to exploit the suffering. Well, they do have to. Yeah. We could talk about that another way. I mean, this was obviously hit very, very hard. Um, it's been, you know, it, it's, it's, I'm now vaccinated. I took the risk of uh, flying up to New York a couple of times to get my vaccine. So I'm now officially in our family, in our house, at El Burrito Vacunado, que sale a ser... <laughs> no, no, <laughs> like, no. I do all the errands, you know, <laughs> very happy, very happy, happy to do that. Um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, we, I, they're, they're just, it's almost impossible to, you know, there's been so many stages of this pandemic in this, in this last year. I just think of, you know, we've had so many ups and downs. I can't get out of my almost visceral memory, the hardest times when everything just felt so gray and so quiet. And, you know, I, I will always associate two sounds with this, with this pandemic being in this very quiet neighborhood that we're in and, you know, hearing, ambulances everywhere during the worst times and also uh, sporadically um, the silence broken by the street musicians because so many street they were the, they were the you know the, the biggest most exciting thing for our two-year-old daughter uh, <laughs> be, to have this silence broken but all of a sudden you'd hear like you know the marimba guy playing outside and she'd go mama, marimba, marimba, marimba. we'd have to all go running outside <laughs> with our masks on and stand like you know 20 feet away and rapidly listen to the marimba player and you know and, and um and, and and you know and, and that was like it everything else just so completely empty and now because they've they've had uh, uh, some success here in mexico city vaccinating uh people over 60 uh, deaths are gone quite a way down. I mean, you know, it's still, you know, there were times when we were getting in here in Mexico City, 400 deaths a day, uh, to 200 deaths a day, you know, so, you know, now it's around 50 deaths a day, which is better, but it's still obviously dangerous out there. We don't know if there's going to be another wave, um, but uh, people are, the city's opening up uh, quite a bit. The restaurants seem pretty full. Uh, I have to say that, you know, the hardest hit people in Mexico were the poor who, you know, who, people who need to, to work every day to feed their families. Uh, that's almost, you know, the percentage of people here who are in the informal economy is incredibly high. And I honestly feel so many of them have had it already, you know, that, um, well, there, 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 there's a bit of immunity out there in the street life right now. You feel like oh, yeah, the people you see out there, a lot of them already had it. You know? So let me let me ask you, putting this within context, because uh, Gina, you've spent a lot of time in the Philippines, which uh, has its up and downs, you know. And you spoke, and uh, you know, we spoke about the disease having a political context and. Uh, and Luisa, you lived through the junta in the 70s. You, were, you left yeah. 
and went to the United States because things were so bad. Uh, and Paco, you, uh, you wrote a lot about, uh, about the wars in Central America uh, during the 1980s. Um, is this, uh, does this epidemic feel like, in a way, it's a tragedy of privilege that for those of us who haven't lived through wars or through uh, th that kind of political uh, uh, terrorism, that this is this is something very big, but is it worse than what um, what you lived through uh, in those times, or is it different? How does it? Uh, it it's really how, different. How different. It's very different. Yeah. Very different. Very different. Yeah. In what in what way, Louisa? Well, it's very different in many senses. You you have nobody to blame. Um, you cannot fight it in a way. And we had some measure of fighting the junta, which was, I, I think it was more scary. It was even worse in, in many senses. But then um, it didn't reach so many people. As Francisco was saying, the poor are very, very much uh, uh, harmed by this and they were not by the, by the military situation as much. Uh, so I don't know what to say, but it's, it's absolutely different. I don't know which one I would choose, but I think if I could choose and the time would be limited, I would choose a pandemic because mm -hmm. it is a more universal. You, you have the feeling that, well, it's something that's not happening to you in a sense that you could have avoided or that you could have done something about it uh, in one sense. And, and human cruelty can be terrible. You're thinking of the tortures and all that is so devastating morally uh, that it's even worse in this pandemic. But then again, it was also political, the political use of the pandemic. I like this government, the present government. I'm very grateful that they won uh, in December last year, well, the year before last. Otherwise, we would have had no total disaster like in the States or in Brazil. But then this opposition is doing such, a, such much harm going against the vaccine, going against all the measures of confinement, all the good measures that can be taken, so as to only to go against the government, not, feel, not knowing, not, not realizing that they're going against the people's health. No? So mm -hmm. they're very different, but there is always a, use, a, a political use of whatever is happening in the world. People manage to get a political use out of it, which is mm -hmm. very scary. Gina, you you teach uh, you teach high school students. Uh, oh, I, I'm just going to say this about. Um, I grew up in the Philippines, so I came to the states only for um, graduate school, and I'm very much tied to what's going on in the Philippines right now. And I will say, unlike, I mean, I'm very glad to hear uh, Luisa about Argentina that you like the current government, and I do remember, let's say, for instance, in the '80s when the Marcos dictatorship um, had to leave because of because of of student uh, because of revolt because of rebellion. I remember mm -hmm. at the time the there was also the fall in Argentina. So I'm really glad to hear that <laughs> right now Argentina's good. But in the Philippines, it is completely fucked. It is so mm. abominable because mm. we have currently a dictator who, I mean, if you look at the political shit of this dictator, um, he's completely um, a Marcos type. He, his father was a Marcos um, uh, official, even though his mom was a uh, Corey person, so she was more of a, a liberal progressive. But this person, one, terrorized Filipinos in 2016, around the same time of the, as the Trump thing, by killing so-called drug addicts. Um, and then has proceeded to, at this point, um, he's been killing activists. He's been killing the communists. He's been killing the peasant organizers. He's been killing the labor organizers. He's been killing climate activists, climate activists in my town, because my town is yeah, well. that was killed by the super typhoon. Uh, oh. hey, um, and now he's using the pandemic um, well, let's say that. to kill, you know, people who go on curfew. And so the, the way he is stabilizing his regime is through complete terror. And the Philippines, unfortunately, I mean, the Philippines, Filipinos, there's no Filipino who's going to go saying bullshit like, I'm not going to wear a mask or I'm not going to do this. These Filipinos, they're very smart about their safety, but they do not have a government 
who's as smart as they are. And it is, mm. it is cryable. What, what my friends in the Philippines are saying, in order to survive this pandemic, if you're a writer, for instance, what do you read? And right now they're thinking, I should read war memoirs, the memoirs of the people who survived war, because the numbers of the dead that they are experiencing is a, it's it's horrendous. So we have multiple 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 terrors in the Philippines. And my problem, okay, this concept of talking about privilege, I don't talk about it because it's useless. Um, you know, if I talk about it in public, if I, you know, my own privilege here in Western Mass, I never, I never bring it up. Um, because one, guilt for me has always been a useless, useless uh, feeling. I never, and I don't feel guilt. I don't feel guilt about being able to wander around with the sheep and the, and the cows here well, in yeah. Massachusetts. But, um, I know that I'm marshalling in my little way, huge anger. And I'm hoping one day I can use it. I don't see myself being able to use it now. Um, mm. I, I find that as a writer, I need to step back. And right now the Philippines is very dire. It's one of the worst in Southeast Asia right now, which shouldn't be the case because you have a very, very smart citizenry. Mm -hmm. Are you read? I mean, since you're all journalists and have been journalists at various times, do you feel that the political stories, I mean, that you talk about with such passion uh, there, Gina, uh, are being reported or is everything sort of subsumed to the medical? Because I look at the, uh, what you've just said about the Philippines, oh, yes. it strikes me, I haven't seen anything in the New York Times in months about the Philippines. And, you know, we generally see very little about South America uh, in the New York Times. Right. But is probably even less. The New York Times, there's a New York Times international editor who's always asking me for stories and I keep telling her, I'm not in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Get the Filipino writers. Mm -hmm. And I give her all the names. Yeah. I mean, how do you feel about that, Paco? I mean, do you feel that... Uh, I mean, the story, in terms of heart guilt, the, the, the story couldn't be more political. I mean, I, you know, the, 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 the most shocking uh, element of the whole pandemic for me that I first kind of really experienced was what happened in New York. Uh, I got out of New York, you know, it, 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 towards late March, but my wife has, is, is, who's, who's uh, Me Mexican, obviously, uh, has many, many friends in New York City, right? Mostly Mexican immigrant, Latin American immigrant uh, uh, woman, uh, uh, many who live with their families and so forth. That whole community was so devastating. It was, almost a crime against humanity, what happened in the, in the Latino neighborhoods of New York and in other, oh. other more impoverished, marginalized neighborhoods of New York. People were dying in their homes. My wife has friends who, who's like their dad died gasping for air on the floor of their apartment, right? With the son trying to give them mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth resuscitation, no, right. and then catching himself and becoming very ill. And many times those, and they couldn't get their families into hospitals. They were literally being turned away from hospitals, right? And, 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 and analysts would come and say, well, there's no point in taking, mean, it was just an extraordinary injustice. And really was, you really just saw how the medical uh, uh, system did not work for those people at all. No, and, and some of them are so traumatized. My wife has friends who haven't left their apartment like in a year. No, uh, uh, they, they were left so frightened. On, yeah. on, the, on the other hand, um, and also I knew people, you know, I, I, I heard stories all the time. I had friends, uh, you know, very privileged friends from the writing publishing world who got sick, no, and they were immediately, you know, gotten, gotten to hospitals and everything else and got taken care of. And then, you know, their own domestic help, often Latin American, would get sick and, 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 and nothing could be done for them almost, right? And, 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 yeah. to, you know, and they'd reach out to me like, you know, my wife was giving, getting addresses and phone numbers of doctors that they, you could get to that, that we passed to them. Now take Guatemala, right? Guatemala, I mean, this is, I was so impressed when I went up to New York for my vaccine and saw 
what was literally a military operation to vaccine people, vaccine people. You know, I, I went to the FEMA site. It's all staffed by soldiers. Right? Guatem you know, and the thing that's just enraging so many people here, Guatemala has no vaccines, right? I mean, people no, here see the United mm. States hoarding vaccines, which it is, mm. right? And, and, and you sit there and you think, you know, after the United States just basically just destroyed Central America in the 1980s into the 90s, destroyed it, utterly destroyed the social fabric of those countries, destroyed the economies of those countries, right? There was never a Marshall Plan to rebuild Central America after those wars, right? And, and, and we keep seeing the repercussions of that over and over. All the people arriving at the borders are a constant reminder to the United States which of course we don't take the lesson, we don't talk about it, it's taboo practically even to mention, right? The role the United States had in creating those circumstances. And yeah. right? I mean, imagine, imagine the United States, I think this, what are the United States, you know, Mexico can handle its own vaccine situation. Mexico, you know, it, it, you know actually does not have, you know, is, is doing as, as good a job as it can with very limited circumstances to vaccinate people. You can't trust the Guatemalan government or any central government with, with vaccine money or trust them to do anything right. Because those governments are so corrupt, right? Why cannot the United States send the army, you know, do FEMA, set up those beautiful- No, 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 no. As a journalist, as a, you're normally go out, as a journalist, go out and you would interview people and you would you would go on to site and you would write a, write these stories up, you know, based on uh, on actually doing the footwork and pounding the pavement and going, you know, are you able to do that? Uh, I mean, you said, Gina, you can't go to the, you're not in the Philippines, but can anyone in the Philippines go and actually report on these stories or is journalism now becoming a question of, you know, I'm not, I'm not denying your outrage, uh, Paco, but, uh, you know, are we, are we just relegated to writing uh, journalism of outrage, which really is, uh, you know, opinion pieces and not reported pieces? You know, has, has the pandemic affected us that way? The, the Philippines, by the way, has one of the highest cases of journalists being killed. So I will say this about the Philippines and from the, I, this is something that people don't really understand about a country that has been so oppressed, both by its own people and by the, um, the foreign, the, the occupation, imperialism, et cetera, et cetera, is that this is the people that has long been inured uh, to suffering, therefore they are resistors. And so there are everyday heroic people doing their work. There are journalists in the Philippines, I read them. Um, many of them, especially if you're in the province, if you're too vocal, you die. I think in Mexico, you can understand that, you know, the, it's the people in the city, the journalists in the city, they can do their work. The people in the provinces who are doing this very risky but important business of reporting what's going on in the towns, they don't have the protection of, of money and power that the city journalists have. So they're the ones who are dying. So I, it's, um, they are there, they're doing work. So it's not just a question of having the masks. It's a question of just being afraid of being shot by. Uh, yeah, um, and uh, a question also of a huge, huge, huge um, venality in this government. It's a venal government. Um, the corruption regarding the vaccines, for instance, they, they have a strong connection. He's really liking China. The current dictator is really liking China and uses- um, Well, they have a connection. Money. It's money. Mm -hmm. Now- I have a question, sorry. What about yeah. Penn? Is Penn Filipino doing anything? Is this a good Penn or no, is it a Penn that is- <laughs> the, current, <laughs> the current head of Penn uh, yeah. is not from, is he, I don't know what's going on with him, but he is very much, um, I don't understand the mindset of a person who might be, it's actually- uh, Because the killing of journalists is a question for Penn, something for Penn to fight about and to really uh, focus on that. There's a weird thing going on with the, um, with the, I don't know what you'd call them, 
my problem is I'm not in the Philippines, so I would be more, I think I'd be more, more forthcoming. I have opinions. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I, I understand. <laughs> what about American Pen? Why don't you go to Pen International to make this uh, claims about the state of journalists, no? One of the things huh? that strikes me, Louise, but we do that. is that uh, there's also the Committee to Protect Journalists. And again, all of these committees rely upon testimony of people actually going places and reporting, uh, you know, and bringing back the stories. And people just aren't traveling. That's one of the, uh, you know, it's one of the effects of the pandemic. And it feels like reporters are, are in a way frozen in place. I mean, mm -hmm. or am, I, am I wrong well, about that? A, a, a lot of um, journalists in Mexico have been, of course, murdered for, and are still being murdered uh, for reporting narco stor stories that that uh, trespass on the, on, on absolutely on and crime. And a lot of journalists have died from the pandemic, mm -hmm. right? Who've gone out and tried to report stories. Uh, 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 I saw a list recently. A lot of you know, and I, every day it seems, and uh, you know, I, I see uh, from Guatemala too. Uh, you know, really sad notices about journalists who died. Journalists have been out trying to do their work, right? Masked and not masked. And a lot of people have done incredible work. A lot of people have dismissed some incredible stories by both foreign press and Mexican press going into the Mexican hospitals, which were real right, disasters. Yes, we do that, yeah. So, so, yeah, you know, so, you know, I, I don't, uh, 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 you know, the problem with a problem like um, you know killing journalists in Mexico. It's not a thing that Penn can really do anything, well, with, right? Well, I've been there. I've been there with <laughs> Penn, with the Penn Committee in Mexico twice, fighting Mexico against needs that to start and prosecuting, denouncing. Investigating. Mexico, Mexico needs to prosecute and investigate these cases, right? Sure. And they haven't. They haven't. So you know. For, well, let me ask you. Uh, we, in this climate, and we've been talking about it from a journalistic point of view, in this climate, is it possible? Have, have you, I know, uh, Paco, you've had uh, Monkey Boys just come out, but that was finished, I imagine, before the pandemic. I mean, have you been able to write fiction during this time? Has this seemed like a time to write fiction? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I found that I, I, I finished Monkey Boy during the pandemic. so. It was much easier to work hard on something that it was that I that was that I was closing in on the end of you know doing final uh, drafts. Um, I myself am used to writing in all kinds of extreme circumstances, you know. So it's not you know I wrote my first novel in the middle of a war that you know so as I'm sure Louisa has too. Yes. Mm -hmm. it's, so I, that, yeah, I, I, I find um, the extreme. But the the stress of this situation of raising a child in this situation of being so concerned and worried about the people around me, uh, feeling just the kind of uh, the way we felt at the worst times of this pandemic, that kind of just feeling of just suffocating, omnipresent sort of doom, did make it hard to concentrate a lot of the time. And it just took you know the, you know so many worries, and I had so much work too, having to teach my classes on Zoom. Uh, so, but, but, so it's, there, there have been challenges, you know, but I don't find that, of course you can write in this circumstance if you're, if you're, if you're concentrated and focused, you know. Yeah, Louisa, are you writing different types of things than you? you know? I, yeah, I was, I wrote, I finished a book, which the first part was the first, my first peste, which was the pandemic of 10, um, 2010, that was an L1H1, and mm -hmm. I had a meningitis. So I, after coming out of that very difficult situation, I started writing about how you to recover writing and what was writing all about for me. And then this went on and went on in a very poetical way. And then I stopped at a certain point. That was it. And it, I couldn't continue it from any other point of view during all these years. Finally, the second pandemic comes and I have all this vision of mm -hmm. what is all about this viruses and things. But funny enough, strange enough, I got an, uh, an ironic sense to this whole thing. God knows why. So the other part was poetical, and this is sort of humorous in many ways. And in the middle of this writing and reflecting and fighting against the anti-vaccine people 
and the uh, flat land people, flat earth people. It was so funny. They were out there protesting and getting sick. Um, I wrote little stories of uh, resilience. Cuentos mm. de la resiliencia, very small, short little stories, funny little stories on resilience. So I was able to write that. And at the same time, I was writing something else on consciousness and the brain and on the working of the brain and all that, which I became very interested on. And now I'm trying a novel. This is just like a second stage. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying, I'm exploring the possibility of writing a novel where there is nothing behind. I, I always wrote without a plan. I, I always wrote without a back or anything. So this, this grew up on its own and I had to find its own words and, and, and tone and, and rhythm for the stories and the characters. This time there was nothing behind. And I started pulling these people out of nothing, nowhere, and, and reflecting on that and working on that. So I'm, I'm quite interested in doing that. So and since there is nowhere to go, I yeah. write. No I go into through. my imagination, the community of the imagination. No? Well, I was going to say, go my own way, brain. Nothing, everything has changed and nothing has changed. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't say that. Yeah, I, I think many things have changed. changed. In the I way mean, it's not a gato pardo, it's not a gato pardo situation, I'm afraid. <laughs> Things I, I, I was hopeful. I mean, I'm sorry, Gina, just a second. I was hopeful last year, I'm not hopeful that any longer, alas, that we would come out wiser and, and finishing with wild capitalism, right. capitalismo salvaje, and finishing with that horror of the land and, and the, the ploiding the land and caring of all this and, and things are getting worse and worse and the millionaires are getting more millionaires and the poor are getting poorer and everything is total disaster so i think i think it's not the same it's much worse in a sense and at the same time there is much more thinking about it from the other side so i hope we can do something and let's do something from from uh, this volcano situation about uh, ecology and, and caring for land and caring for the land gina that you're out there in the in the countryside, yeah. really caring, taking care of the Pachamama. What about for you, Gina, in terms of the I, I just wanted to say that um, reading Luisa and reading Francisco has also is also a huge refuge and haven for people. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've really been I the, I think the work that you've done, um, uh, uh, writing through um, your the horrors of the violence right, you too. Of, of your times. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's very useful. Um, I was just reading the set. I mean, I'm just reading your, your um, even the work that you did in New York where, uh, you know, the, the black, um, I think, novel. yeah, the black, black novel, you know, black novel. Um, where you can see the, um, the terrors coming through, even in this other world that you have. And I, and I will say, I, I, I respond to that work. And, and, and um, Thank you. Work Francisco at, Harp, at Harper's, you know, where I got all of the, my information about Central America, I respond to that work. Um, I think because I grew up with violence, I grew up writing through violence. And yeah. I have written through violence. Yeah, so I see, I know, yeah. I know really yeah. weird to say, I have, I have always written out of pleasure, which is a really weird thing to say, given yeah, well, the world that I've grown up with. I've, yeah. I wrote through the Marcus dictatorship. I wrote through the, the suicide of my husband. I didn't write mm. when he was killed, I, I, when he died. I, I, I didn't write for seven years, but I managed to get back to writing mm -hmm. because I think writing has been, for whatever reason, in my body, a way to survive. Because I grew yeah. up, I grew up with the feeling I need to survive. I need to survive the madness of my childhood dictatorship world. I need to survive. Um, yeah, I I think I needed even to survive my huge disappointment with the Philippines after the rebellion of '86. I was yeah. hugely disappointed with what happened to the government. It was not the government that I felt we deserved. Um, so I need to survive disappointment. I need to survive disillusion and writing has done that, but I do it. And I will say this, you talked about irony and, and comedy. Yeah, uh, yes. We need that. I don't write satire. I do not write satire. People say I write satire. I don't believe I do because I don't have that 
I think the thing about satire is that it requires a coldness that in my view, I cannot and mm -hmm. will not. Mm -hmm. So I've written, I, I did write during the pandemic. Um, I finished a novel, very different kind of novel, but it was a very familiar feeling to be writing under horror. Yeah. yeah. Well, I can feel uh, the audience buzzing out there. And I know Magda has some questions from, uh, from that community out there for, uh, for all of you. So Magda, uh, do you have, a, you have some questions out there? Well, there's a call for questions, absolutely. And I, the comments are, are flooding the chat. Um, it's it's clear that people are are kind of stunned by the the energy, the power, the analogies is what I'm picking up, uh, especially um, because all of you have spoken of war and violence as, in a sense, uh, the parallel experience or an analogous experience. Um, maybe greater, maybe lesser to the pandemic, but it's clear from, from all of you, uh, from, from the comments that I'm seeing as well, which reflect this, the sense that this is epic. And um, I guess um, I'm, I'm waiting to see actually some very specific questions that look like questions. And until I do, um, I'm gonna throw out one of my own, which I hope will spark some others. And um, I think it's something we're all grappling with. How much of a, what the French call a recul, how much uh, of, a, of a distance or an aftermath might it take to uh, write something that is more than a, a snapshot, a record? Not that that's not also urgent to do, to document what's happening in the now, but I think, Francisco, you talked about it's, it's almost too soon. And I just wonder, you know, uh, you've, you've all been writing, so you're obviously writing something, but do you feel that there's work to be written, fiction that will emerge uh, from you or others uh, looking at this, this experience? Well, it's all part of a whole, as you just said, right? If it's, if it's the pandemic, you know, war, Justice, climate, um, so, you know, it, it's all part of the same world we're inhabiting. And I think that we all are conscious as, as we come out of this pandemic. I think the one thing we're all going to know, which you know, we may have known before, but in some way we're, we're all like now we're unified in our apprehension of this is that we're all very vulnerable. The world, we live in a very, you know, these are times that make us feel very vulnerable. And the world feels very damaged and and all humankind you know seems at risk in a different way and i think that will inform our writing in different ways uh as, probably as we go forward it might make you just you know want to be more tender in your writing it might make you want to be more you know attentive as, as lisa says to to private forms of resilience it might make other writers more you know you know more active outwardly political, I think, you know, it's not just, you know, writing, I think that the community of writers are going to respond to this in all different ways, obviously. You know? I, myself, don't feel any pressure at this moment to write a pandemic novel. I'm, you know, already working on things that started. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it's just, that, no, sorry, no, no, go ahead, Jonathan, no, no, go ahead. In general, I think that writers, you know, write from whatever their little corner of the garden is, and uh, it may have some type of resonance uh, in a larger way. You hope that somehow, you know, your little story is going to have a bigger uh, sense. But I don't know many writers who go out there trying to write the bigger sense, uh, because usually that turns into, uh, that's propaganda, or it's, uh, um, you know, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're tilling their corner of the field. Um, I mean, give you an example. I had a, uh, I had an opera that, uh, that premiered uh, a week before all the theaters closed down in New York. And uh, so I spoke to the composer about writing a companion piece. It was a little one act opera for a man. And I thought, well, I'll write a companion piece for his wife. And I imagined that she would be a, a trauma doctor 
dealing with COVID patients. And yet as the story of the of COVID kept going on, I thought, I've got to add this, I've got to add this, I've got to add this. And I finally realized, no, I don't. I've got to write, you know, what the story is of a person in this position, uh, you know, with her husband, with her daughter. It's the same as writing anything else. Uh, you know, you hit it small and hope that it has a bigger impact when someone else hears it. I, I always wonder where do stories come from at this very deep level? Because one starts with a purpose and then this whole thing turns on on you and it goes on on its own. Uh, and, and that is a great part about writing when it really is working. And I was wondering when, when Gina said she wrote for survival, I think you're right to try to understand. I don't understand anything if I don't write it. Then I understand a little bit, not much, but then I start seeing <laughs> things clearly. And then there are things that are getting into some perspective. So perhaps a need to understand this pandemic will come afterwards, if, if we ever get over it, and then it, it yeah. seeps down and it decanta, and, uh, and then you will be able to, to bring it out from a very different order and a very different position, not a direct mm -hmm. view of what is going on. No? I think, for instance, just in response to that, I was thinking about, for instance, the way Camus responded to his experience of war, which oddly, he talked about a plague, you know, so it wasn't war, but it was la peste. But no. it was a peste, it was, again, this is word. I, I like peste, I don't like plague. <laughs> so it's interesting uh, to think about the ways in which it will manifest, that deeper way in which you're saying it might manifest, where you're actually not going to be talking about the pandemic. And I do recognize that the ways I write, I don't talk about the things that actually are what I'm oh, talking about. Yes. I, I was telling my grandchildren a year ago, more or less, a little over a year, less than a year ago, I said, well, you're lucky because all this that is happening, I won't ever be able to tell it to my grandchildren because they are here and they're living through it. So, so you will have your grandchildren be able to tell this very weird times we are living through. And they said, weird? What is it weird all about? And I, I found that terrible, that they found it sort of natural to be walled in and the virus all over the world and all that. And What's going on yet, there, no? And yet parents are being told now, don't tell your parents, don't tell your kids this is weird because you're going to you know, create uh, all kinds of psychological problems. But they are old enough to be able to handle that. You know? yeah. <laughs> but I suppose it has to be with that. Mm. I'm amazed at how, uh, how our daughter already understands it. It's, you know, she understands, you know, anytime she understands this, this, this she, it's, she understands there's a virus out there that's very dangerous, we have to wear a mask, that it's the reason that we're inside. Uh, and it's just both really moving and really heartbreaking to see, you know, how much joy she takes in, in even like the distant encounters that, that she has with, let's say, other children in the park. Children in the park now can't go play together in the playgrounds like they used to. But they get, but they see in the park and they stop and they look at each other and they call to each other and they, and they ask each other their names and say things to each other from a distance. <laughs> and, they get such joy from it. And I, you know, it's going to be to me such a, a, an stirring thing to see this pandemic end and see her finally be able to go into the community of other children and hug them and play with them. And it's, you know, it's, 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 it's a uh, buildings Roman happened before my very eyes, you know, growing up in the pandemic and growing up out of it. It's uh, something I feel privileged to be able to witness. Well, it'd be know? fascinating to see what kind of children's literature comes out of this. Um, yeah, there's already some. I brought back a book from New York that explained yeah. the pandemic to children. It's like, why do we have to be inside? There's a story about a little girl and her cat, and the mother explaining to them, and you know, why do people have to be inside now? It was a really beautiful book. Mm. Mm. So many forms of thought are being challenged, and I was struck by what you said, Francisco, about um, attention and tenderness, and that you know, the, the ways that the experience of living in this, and I'm not sure yet we can say through it and to the other side, we just don't know, but that the, the sort of difference between inner and outer and how, uh, 
how our work might frame itself, uh, I think are sorts of things we, we can't even yet know. It's just, um, as we're in the age of uncertainty, among other things, it feels like we'll find out as we go. But we have a question from Elizabeth Rossner, who's one of our faculty this year teaching writing of witness, um, asking you all sort of what are you reading? What is helping you through that inspires you right now? Seems like a good question to ask writers what you're reading. You know, I, I've read a lot of Filipino Maoists through the years, um, but I've never read Karl Marx. So I'm reading Capital. It's very, <laughs> it's really good. It's very clear. It's very lucid. <laughs> I was reading a lot about neuroscience. God knows I got that uh, curiosity at a certain point. And, um, I'm reading, I'm rereading humorous things also just to perk me up and watching a lot of TV a little too much. I watch the news all the time. <laughs> and I love, I love this channel that says Sincuena that is against the former government and it's all the time denouncing things and the fake truth and all that. So this fight against fake truth and, uh, and, uh, post, post, uh, whatever. Uh, it's just terrible. I mean, it's very interesting the way they're lying to you and this is coming out and there's no way of changing things. So I'm stuck in that and I'm not reading that many novels except those that my good friends sent me that they just wrote, which were wonderful. But not, not, um, I'm a, I became quite lazy in that sense. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, you know, I had to, uh, uh, in fact, I teach at Trinity College in Connecticut, and I had to teach this you know, on Zoom. And I find preparing classes for Zoom is much more work than preparing classes for in person, right? Because if you're there on the screen and you're not prepared, boy, does it show up, right? You have a three-hour yeah. weekly seminar, and you have to keep their attention for the entire three hours. So I've never prepared. I've never worked so hard to prepare my classes. And they asked me to do a, a, a class on uh, because it, you know, on, on geared to this time, so class on literature of trauma and resilience, basically, right? And and uh, you know, I've been through as we talked about, I've been through war. You know, I've been through. I lived in New York during the AIDS crisis. Uh, I had a very tragic, traumatic personal loss in the death of my first wife in, in an accident. I uh, been through a lot, seen a lot, and so I put together a reading list, and I just. Loved working, you know, I read such, such a, obviously Camus, The Plague was in the, in the course. I put my friend Yuri Herrera's book, The Transmigra Transmigration of Souls in the course, which is a, a mm. book that, that, that saw the play coming. No, Severance by uh, that wonderful novel Severance that was written ahead of the play. And then I, 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 we did uh, Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, Norwegian, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or, you know, suicide and, getting, and surviving death, uh, and books I'd, I, I, I never had taught Beloved before, oh. and I don't think I've, I fell so deeply in love with that book, being able to mm -hmm. just stretch it out over three weeks and just really dig into it, and Woman Talking by Miriam Toas, I think was my favorite, I put that because I was curious about it, I had not read it before, and just an just, a, just an extraordinary book, no? And I think, uh, again, friends sent me their books and I just read uh, my good, my next door neighbor and very good friend Alejandro, Alejandro Zamdas, uh, Puerto Chileno, which is fantastic. And also Rivka Galchin's book, mm -hmm. right? That, that, uh, they say your mother is a witch, which is just the most extraordinarily enchanting book and very much deeply personal, quirky, imaginative response to these last few years, right? Because the plague we lived through in some way, uh, sort of this dark, dark time of crisis, which I think we all, it, it is, right? Feels to, I think most of us, like it began even before the pandemic, oh, right? God, yes. Yes, well, you know, it really intensified before the pandemic, you know, this, these last five years or so, especially, right? And I think her book is kind of a response to that. And really great, really idiosyncratic and imaginative and wonderful. You'll love it. Uh, we, we need to um, draw the curtains 
in, in just a moment, but I want to say how much people have appreciated your reading list, Francisco, and I think that's a course we uh, we would all sign up for in a second. Um, but people have been writing down the names of titles. Um, to be continued, what can I say? Jonathan, thank you so much for leading us into this and leading us to the outer edge of it. And thank you to all of you for being with us today and adding to the conversation. And please come back, join us for the next two Wednesdays. And um, Gina, we have to get you to Teposlan. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you to our wonderful audience. And we will see you uh, next on another Zoom.